Professor Weisser has already introduced my broad exegesis, which is really about um, my understanding of the concept of ecolopes as applied retrospectively to the work we do in my practice and um, set out a, a little framework of that, um, pretty much done uh, uh, with, with no apology from the top of my head because it was my reaction to the whole program and what I've read so far and what, pro what presentations, excellent presentations I've seen already in the program. Uh, as a framework before leaping into um, the, the two case studies which are linked um, it, it, geographically and I think uh, from a point of view of symbolism uh, a very important part of the disciplinarity of making things happen at scale for biodiversity and, and landscape resilience is the idea of scaling up and affecting more and more of the planet to do the right thing. We don't do that purely by being scientific. We do that by changing hearts and minds. And some of the people who change hearts and minds best are not scientists. They're artists, um, uh, uh, poets, and so forth. Um, and we need to engage a lot more with folk of that genre. So I, I, I'm not intending anyone should read this, but I set out, if anybody uh, looks at this presentation later on, um, a set of um, uh, uh, principles um, uh, for um, the um, ecolope design. Um, and I'm not going to dwell on looking at those now because I've taken them one by one. Uh, and I don't intend to spend a huge amount of time on this. This is really more a, a practical guide, a very pragmatic consultant's approach to these issues in day-to-day -day practice. Um, the first, I always like to start with the blindingly obvious to anybody who cares about design and, and humanity and urbanism, which everybody on this call probably does, um, is that when you work in practice, you sometimes wonder whether people that are designing cities and urban areas um, really know what they're doing you know they seem to conceptualize buildings as shelters as places of essentially survival and you know when we are faced with the fact that globally we're 50 percent urban and in the western europe i think it's closer to 80 percent uh, globally it's going to be over a quarter by 2050 surely uh, we have a challenge there that it's not just about making enough dwellings for us all to survive in we need to thrive I'm a great believer in the Ascent of Man and Bronowski's work. And, you know, there is a nice contrasting picture there between uh, an image of Greenwich, which was created over 10 years after, um, uh, you know, the site was a brownfield degraded site and, and a man in a foxhole, which sort of demonstrates for me what incredible powers of stoicism and endurance we have as a species, which has got us through hard times, has got us through cataclysmic events of the past. But the problem is it's also a problem for us because we're so good at survival. We sometimes don't optimize our environments and we force people to live in substandard environments for decades and decades after schemes are built because not enough thought is given to thriving humanity um, and too much is given to sometimes commercial experience and basic shelter creation. So I think it may be an obvious point, but I thought I'd make it anyway. The next point is, can we address the biodiversity crisis in urbanism. Um, when I started in this, it was a very massively, I would say extremely open question because there were many people in the conservation movement in the UK and leading conservationists who felt anyone playing around with urban ecology was sort of wasting their time. And when there were so many challenges in the countryside and conservation, largely through modern farming, um, you know, why were we you know, spending good time and money on urbanism? I got very interested in this, and over time, I mean, this is just one example of green roofs, which everyone on this call will know about uh, uh, quite a bit or a little bit, is that, yeah, I'm quite convinced now that um, by accident or by design, true rarity can occur in cities. This has been emphasized by other people on the Ecolope series, I've noticed, including our colleagues from Australia. And I um, and I think that it's, it's worth uh, noting that uh, you can actually see an urban ecology partly in terms of the social project of creating an arc um, whilst the countryside, we hope one day, recovers from industrial, industrial agriculture. So many of the species we're finding as rarities in urban areas have been rendered very uncommon or extinct in the countryside due to modern agricultural practices, herbicides, pesticides, and so on, and drainage. And 
many a time in, in the last 30 years, I have seen examples of where we're finding species which are truly rare, not just through uh, survey effort, which is always a confounding factor, but through actual rarity in the city, occurring um, quite often on roof spaces, which are relatively undisturbed. Um, and so, yes, and then how much better could we do if we intended to create this result rather than it happening literally, literally by default? Similarly, in terms of um, the crises we need to address is the climate crisis. And it, the issue of decarbonizing our world um, uh, to reduce emissions and fight climate change is obviously focal to architecture today. But I'm often saddened by the way architects uh, sometimes treat other aspects of urbanism in this debate as almost an irrelevance. Um, because we have m &E systems that can deliver incredible results, we can create incredibly insulated uh, buildings, we can decarbonize our grid with wind power and so on, we can achieve a lot of the results of climate neutrality without concerning ourselves with the rest of urban design. That is not creating a city for people to thrive in. And um, so the issue of green and blue infrastructure combined with technical infrastructure and gray infrastructure to create holistically designed cities that work together and address climate change in that model is crucial. And this is an example of a paper published jointly with colleagues at the University of Bath School of Architecture, um, which produced some uh, counterintuitive results about the effects of water bodies in urban areas and the fact that they don't always cool urbanism because if they're designed wrong, the wrong sort of spatial arrangement or gaining too much solar gain and they're too deep, their heat capacity can be actually a thermal generator. And so there is interesting things in counterintuitive results. And to see the buildings of systems in isolation is to miss a major trick of uh, urban design in terms of neutrality of car carbon and climate change. And that leaves aside all the other effects of climate change, such as climate, uh, water, rainfall, storms, and so on. As Professor Weisser said at the beginning, it's, it's really important, obvious once said, but needs saying, that every project should be seen as macro, meso, micro. There is a terrible tendency in real practice for what I call red line-itis or, or site-itis. You get a boundary, everybody focuses their huge efforts towards solving a design problem within that planning boundary, overlooking the context in which the site's sitting. And it's so obviously a problem that it needs, but it needs saying, because I just keep seeing it happen again and again and again. And I see the way the ecolopes, if you like, need to be looked at. It's very much like the series of Russian dolls as a nested series. Um, and in similarly, the human being needs to be looked at in that sense, that the human being, as we now realize, is a walking colony, for one thing, not an individual. And it's his or her or health can be seen in many different contexts, including global processes. Um, in the sense of an ecolope that you should start with, how about the stratosphere? And the atmosphere. I mean, a, a new area of endeavor, a uh, fascinating endeavor of geobiology is looking at how all the ecosystems of Earth are interconnected through global processes, species moving about, not uh, by migrating under their own volition, but they're moving through global processes in the atmosphere and even electromagnetism. Uh, the little image there is of a little spider about to take off, it's doing what it calls pointing, where it sets on its legs, it spins a bit of silk that's lighter than it is, and then it gets taken up into the stratosphere, and distributes around the planet. Um, we thought by wind, but in fact, we're now realizing it's also done by the Earth's magnetic field. So where is your ecolope now? You need to see these processes as global. And when we start talking about other forms of life, such as viruses that cause uh, pandemics, uh, very similar issues of concern apply. When no one can consider themselves isolated in that sense. Um, and the issue of um, scale is uh, brilliantly for the human body is illustrated wonderfully by this and the connection back to the biosphere. Uh, more and more research, this is an example of a paper from Finland, but more research has been done since, but it's um, a nice illustration comparing populations in urban areas and rural areas and examining human skin biota what is the mixture of 
um, uh, microorganisms living on the body, which don't just live there and hitch a ride, but communicate through the skin as an organ into the physiology of the body and can affect health, can affect stress, can affect many uh, internal systems of the body as shown by this slide, the neuroendocrine system. So the basic finding was people in more biodiverse areas with greater natural biodiversity had a higher biota and got sick less. So it's very interesting that this is, again, is where is your ecolo when you consider the human being holistically rather than uh, as an, a statistic in an urban calculation. Um, in terms of um, the way we approach biodiversity, for many, many years before it became a popular thing, and I'm, I must say this is no blowing trumpets, but very true, since the mid-90s, we've been thinking about how urban biodiversity can better deliver ecosystem services to man and to itself. And, you know, the papers that have come out in recent times, I mean, here's one in 2011 and in 2022, constantly focusing on this issue of what is the relationship between the things we need in nature, such as stability in the face of big environmental shocks that are coming our way, already here, and biodiversity. And the consensus across ecosystems is that there is a stabilizing function, the more appropriately biodiverse ecosystems are, and that we also need to understand what is biodiversity, what kind of biodiversity we're talking about in our ecolo, because it's not just species diversity. Uh, it's interspecific, as intraspecific diversity, differences between individuals and their strategies, and also very much ecosystem diversity. And all of those diversities are needed to stabilize the situation. And so when you're talking about urban design for resilient cities, these become very important conceptual ideas uh, related into practice. It's interesting how everything coalesces as these sorts of theory, think, thinking, this sort of thinking gets more and more globalized. And we face uh, a global awareness of massive environmental challenges such as climate change. And this is an example in the health sphere of two key terms that if you go to any health conference at the moment will be bandied around willy nilly as the crucial new way, nothing new about it really, but new in terms of mainstreaming the, the, the treatment of health. W one concept being one health and the other total health. And what do they mean? Well, in a nutshell, one health is just what I've been talking about. The fact you can't see human medicine in extraction from what is going on with other fauna, a huge issue. Look at, look at the suggested origins of COVID, uh, potentially coming from tropical bats, uh, subtropical bats, and then the environment itself, the healthy environment, and how, how huge that effect can be on human beings, whether it be physical, psychological, or both. And then the division between typical views of the human being's health as being a physical thing versus a psychological thing is now being broken down very much by this concept of total health um, and these different conceptualizations of health and how they have to be considered jointly in design. Because even somebody's socio, you cannot subtract somebody's socioeconomic status from their psychological health, from their physical health, um, and indeed their intellectual and educational level. Uh, these are all different nuances and forms of health, and yet do they get talked about in mass play? Do we ever really get to the bottom of how we're trying to make people feel in urbanism? This thriving thing again, it's never debated ever in any master plan project team I ever work in. It may be being thought of by experts, but it's not overtly debated. And as a result of that, I think a lot of opportunities for design go uh, begging. Examples of why this is important, you all know, but many people in the wider public may not realize, you know, that we, we don't fix it by design in urbanism. We fix it by design in medicine. So we provide vast amounts of um, antidepressants, you know, 100 billion worth. And we have um, other results in this regard, which is staggering, which is, you know, like we are, um, you know, in the UK, 21.2 million antidepressant drugs hundreds of millions a year, and all they're doing is dealing with the symptoms, not the cure, the cause. As Tom Wolfe said in the, bio, in the bonfire of the vanities, the famous novel, no one can take reality straight anymore. You know, we're, we're assailed from every corner by global problems and challenges. And we've learned through COVID just how important environment can be in taking away the need for this uh, ineffective 
an extremely expensive quick fix. And total health has to be in the eco health of all species. And an example many people will here be extremely familiar with is bird collision with glass buildings. I mean, the statistics are truly eye-watering. In the UK alone, they reckon maybe 100 million birds collide with them to their deaths in glazing. These pictures I took myself in Switzerland on a green roof tour. These are nuthatches that hit this building on the left, which reflects the forest next to it. Very beautiful scene, nice architecture aesthetically, but a bird killing machine. And we have the solutions to this sort of problem, but how often is it actively and seriously debated as a global crisis? And I would put that word forward across the world. Many billions of birds die, and it's not just common species. If you only take a small percentage of rare species out, it's another pressure they don't need, and you're racing them towards extinction. But we have solutions to this, but are they debated as a fundamental part of urbanism and design on every project as they should be? No, they're not. You can't have life without water as far as we know. And it interests me that whilst there is so much more sophistication about water in urbanism amongst the cognoscenti, so many projects are scared stiff of water. Um, nice to have, but when it comes to the design, it's value engineered out or considered too dangerous for maintenance or whatever. And yet we know the benefits of it are some of the highest multi multifunctional benefits. And that's why both the schemes I'll talk about in a minute are very watery. The picture on the right isn't accidentally chosen by Terrapin Bright Green, the wonderful company in America that specializes in biophilic design. It sums up biophilic design with that in relationship between urbanism and water. It's fundamental to the biophilic canon of health benefits through nature. But it has to be clean water, ideally flowing. These are the psychological cues we recognize from our uh, distant evolutionary past as positive places to live. And the, the treatment of water as a waste product and not treating it through sustainable drainage is now an urban no-no, really. Um, but we need to take it so much further than that, especially with climate change. Every single project should be water sensitive design rather than just sustainable drainage. And beyond that, I think it should be water imaginative design because water is such a powerful biophilic stimulus. Another theme that I thought was relevant to this eco concept was this issue of mimicry. And many people here will have known of the work of Michael Paulin. Uh, the architect in biomimicry. And uh, may some people may or may not know this book here by Ken Yang, which I was the scientific editor of, had a lot to do with, um, which rose, raised the concept of ecomimesis. Now, what's the difference? We know we can learn a lot from biomimicry and seeing how nature solves problems. They've done it for thousands of years. Most drugs that we take come from a starting point in nature. They don't start from complete... Uh, uh, raw elements most of the time. So the evolutionary process of nature have done a lot of work for us already. But really, we should be looking at urbanism not as biomimicry, but ecomimicry, which is to say to try and make the urban ecosystem have as many of the pro product, pro uh, properties of the natural ecosystems as we can. Properties such as homeostasis, this ability to keep a level environment under threat, uh, under, under various types of insult. And when I talked to Professor Weiser earlier, we we're talking about what we meant by the ecology that we're trying to mimic. And for years, Ken Yang has talked about what he calls the eco cyborg, the combination of nature and technology, which um, is a very interesting concept. And of course, you know, it's a lovely uh, sci fi image, but I don't think it's been taken seriously or written about academically very well as yet. Uh, on the right of this picture is a very a uh, common and fairly quotidian example now of a bio solar roof where you have solar panels on a green roof. This is Switzerland again. Um, but the point of this picture isn't that you've got power generation and green stuff. It's the fact it's symbiotic. So that the microorganisms such as that spider I showed earlier benefit from the varied topography and shade environment of the solar panels. And the solar panels benefit from the green roof by cooling, which increases their electrical output, which in some hot days can be as by as much as 30%. So this is a true symbiotic relationship. And Ken talks quite often about a seamless integration of nature and technology to create new ecologies. 
Um, in fact, he often talks about a quattro-brid rather than a hybrid of the four infrastructures, green, blue, gray technical, and social. And I think that's a very powerful way of looking at ecolopes. Another issue is that if we start caring about this stuff and have these goals in mind, then we need to start having metrics and decide what we're designing for and how to measure it. Some years ago, we this book was published, uh, probably a decade ago now, Green Design Theory to Practice, in which we produced a chapter called Understanding the Drivers and Setting Targets for Biodiversity and Urban Green Design. And again, in practical projects, this has to be quite practical. It can't be too highfalutin and scientific. Generally, there isn't the time and budget. So we produced a matrix of faunal species versus habitats to see if you really wanted these fauna to turn up in this urban envelope, how would you change the master plan? How would you have to look at the different ecologies, the different requirements, the different seasonal requirements, different habitat requirements for different activities, whether it be breeding, feeding, or whatever, um, to achieve that rather than leaving it to chance? And, and, and the results are interesting because it changes your, your master plan. So as soon as you start designing actively for the ecologies, autoecology, other autoecologies, you change layouts, juxtapositions, um, edge effects, all of these things, ecotones, they all change. And this cannot be done retrospectively very well. It has to be at the get-go. It has to be in the first day of the master planning process. So this is a very interesting, simple tool. We call it the ecological matrix which we use on most projects in urbanism. And then the metrics mustn't just be about whether we've got rare spiders, which are fantastic and maybe the next cure for cancer through their genetics, but also in terms of the ecosystem services. And we don't talk half enough about it. It's coming through to the UK now that we've got biodiversity net gain as a legal requirement this November. Following hot foot from that, we soon will have environmental net gain where someone in a project team will have to quantify the ecosystem service benefits of a design. And this is one example I often quote to, to, to friends is, is Camley Street Nature Reserve, a very small pocket park built some years ago in London, one of the first ecology parks in London, which uh, was evaluated by environmental economists at WS Atkins, and they calculated this very, very small park, probably produced over 3 million sterling per annum in ecosystem services, largely to do with the effect on health, well-being, rental values, uh, property prices, crime rates, and all these indirect benefits of cost avoidance as much as benefit generation. So we need to get smarter about selling the metro, metricizing the benefits and quantify them where we can, although always being aware of the limitations of these sorts of quantifications because they can never capture all the benefits. And then, when I saw the Ecolope papers and this um, very nice paper I just put printed out uh, about how the, the, the uh, modeling could come into all of this, immediately um, raised with me what we've been doing recently on several projects, including in Monaco, where we've been working with a company in the States called Ecometrics, and they have what they call an ecosystem intelligence EI platform. And what this does in a nutshell is quantify the likely ecosystem service provision of your scheme um, in relative terms against certain standards and against your current baseline condition and reproducing the result of that graphically. So you can, as you change the design, you see what you win and what you lose and where the balance lies. It, it, it's not coming up with the answer 57 or something. It is, it is a visual output where you can see where you benefit and where you disbenefit. And depending on what ecosystem services you care about in a given location, you can see how your design is affecting them. It's incredibly useful. And uh, this is now a much more user-friendly open platform now for wider dissemination. The other example here is Green Pass, which is a, a similar sort of tool developed in, in, in Europe, which many developments are now taking advantage of, which again provides checks along the way for modeling of um, build form envelopes and their relationship to interstitial spaces. Um, vegetated architecture and so on. So these tools are emerging and, you know, I'm sure uh, more will come through the sort of research you guys are doing. And this is the paper that I printed that basically says that we need to combine these things and start to optimize. We can't just say, um, leave it to chance or quality design. If we can quantify things, then we should try and do so. 
But I'm a great believer in where things can't be fully quantified, we quantify them in semi-quantitative ways rather than leave them out of the model. Final point of my uh, rabbiting on on this is from James Wine's book on architecture, ecological architecture, where one little thing he said, and when I first started to try and usurp the territory of you good architects as an ecologist, it really hit me straight away. Uh, right at the end of the book, he said, if it's not beautiful, it's not going to catch on, guys. It's a very dangerous word to use these days, loaded with, I would be shocked by the Royal Society of Arts for even mentioning it, I'm sure. However, um, if, if I had to retreat to a corner, I would choose the biophilic corner and say, well, we've worked on schemes where it's pretty obvious what benefits we're getting. Call it beauty if you like. Um, ask a biologist what beauty is. And you might speak to E.O. Wilson, the world's most famous living biologist, evolutionary biologist, who said, and I paraphrase, biodiversity in the landscape it is everything in nature that is fundamental to our survival. And very interesting. So we are hardwired to love and to be moved towards and emotionally attracted to things that fundamentally in our past were beneficial to our evolutionary survival. Very interesting thought, an interesting theory. The picture on the left is from Nottingham University campus. We worked on years ago with Michael Hopkins. Um, the buildings are, are quite biomimetic. The water cycle was treated holistically from A to Z, and this it was a brownfield site regenerated. Um, the issue of biophilic design, although it didn't exist as a canon of design at that time, was nonetheless addressed in its more early incohate stages. And it found its way onto the front book, front page of a book by Keller on biophilic uh, buildings. On the right is Stockholm and the famous Stockholm planting beds, which are a way of breaking up the surface of the ground so that trees can breathe. And then all of a sudden, when they do this and they can plant these uh, colorful flowers at the base, more air and water get in and the trees health massively improves and the uh, ecosystem services they can provide to cities massively improves. Um, but how to make it catch on? Well, a good way of doing it is to make it stunning. And so I say my beauty response is, is, is based on the passionate belief in the biophilia hypothesis and, and the canon of biophilic design. This is quite an old book now, Kellett and Hirwagen is, is old now, Maddow. Uh, so much more has been written now. And the data constantly uh, reinforce um, the scale of effects, which is quite surprising uh, in terms of you know, for example, the effects on productivity in offices or creativity in offices is not marginal, one or two percent. These are many tens of percent. Um, and the sort of organizations that don't need telling this are the mega companies. You know, go to Apple's headquarters, go to Google. Their, their sites are incredibly biophilic designed. There's huge attention to nature and, and exposure to vitamin N, as it's now called in all they do in order to get better productivity out of their very competitive, competitively positioned employees. So moving to examples, um, why the Greenwich Meridian? I showed this to a colleague of mine and he said, you need to explain this, Mike, because it's not gonna be obvious to people, but I am getting old and I'm getting to the point in my life where I want my last projects to be, um, have scale and impact around the world. I would love some of my, final projects to be in the developing world, where we have a massive problem that's leading to migration, a huge problems for the developed world, as we well know, and huge problems with terrorism creeping in because of the poor state of development of these countries. But if they develop at the rate that they are doing now, badly, we're all doomed. So the Meridian Line is a rather powerful tool that just so happens to go through where I live in little old England and work in London. The Greenwich Meridian Line is in Greenwich in London, a World Heritage Site, and it is the starting point of time as unified across the world. And we have in London the clock of the long now, which is tied into GMT, but it, is, it, is, it tells the time incredibly slowly. It's the slowest clock in the world. Um, it's being rebuilt in America. Now, the aim of this clock is to point out to us that because we are who we are, we live a very short time span, we are psychologically ill disposed towards looking at long time scales and the sort of time scales you need to look at when you're dealing with ecosystems and geological processes. 
And so looking at time scales differently, so the so the time envelope of, of what one's talking about is really fundamental. And so here's a couple projects on the Meridian. Greenwich Peninsula, which I talked to Michael about a few years ago, and he worked, well, kindly uh, hosted a conference in the States that I talked at. Um, the Millennium Dome, you may have heard of, which is uh, right to the next the Meridian line. And the athletes finished the Olympic Games 2012, which is on, virtually on the same line, up the uh, another river called the River Lee, which connects to the Thames. So in terms of London's um, symbolism, these are hugely important for many reasons. A, on the Meridian line. B, they're hugely important regeneration sites, highly polluted, and the issue of putting nature back where it's been lost. Um, both very good examples of that, but they also uh, potentially give us a showcase for how we can talk to the rest of the world about putting urbanism in order. The Greenwich Peninsula back in the late early 90s looked like this. It was um, a regenerating brownfield sites of various vegetation growing back from where the biggest industrial gas works had been in Europe back in the 1950s. And highly, highly contaminated. In fact, it was debated at the time whether you could regenerate this. It was actually viable to regenerate it and whether it was best just to cap it over and um, forget about it. Um, its site, its location is incredibly symbolic in London. It, you have here the flood barrier, you have the London City Airport and the docks. It was, it's was. it been huge in history, obviously Greenwich, the maritime history of Greenwich is a global hub for explorers to go out and see the world. It had all this symbolism attached to it. And so when we were looking at the regeneration project, um, when I was looking at the regreening of the peninsula, I thought this would come down the list very low uh, to the authorities who were looking for a theme. But that's not what happened. What actually happened was they loved the idea of the regreening of Greenwich and creating a new green envelope, an ecolope, if you like, for the whole peninsula. And the thinking was that. The peninsula, as you can see from this picture of 874, was the last to be developed. You can see across the river, it already is all grey, the Isle of Dogs and places like this. By uh, 1937, you had Mordor with virtually a, not a blade of grass living on it and incredibly short lifespans of people working on it. Um, natural colonization, but on a very contaminated, contaminated site. And so the thinking was to have some core green spaces, but then not stop at that and take the green fabric through the interstitial spaces of the new development and across its roof space and around the entire river edge. So if you like, three different ecolopes, and I'm just gonna spend a bit of time looking at each of those. So this was our cunning plan for way to conceptualize the regeneration of the peninsula. Um, the edge, the matrix <laughs> through the middle and the green and the roofs. And bear in mind, this is 1995, at a time when this sort of urban greening was not majorly pursued in the UK. You know, Germany was ahead of the game on this. Um, after the war, de Groener and other movements moved it forward. But here we were very slow. And um, this was the first major project of its kind in, in, in this sort of thinking. So. After the regeneration started and the first elements of the <clears throat> of the matrix were put in, this is a photograph with the Millennium Dome. And I just want to point out three features. One is the river edge on the right here. One is right at the bottom that's almost cut off by the page, which is, you can see the colorful buildings, Ralph Erskine's village, which has got a wetland in it. And, and then the central part, which I also want to talk about briefly. So in terms of seeing the ecolope of this, scheme we really have to start with the wider health of the environment and everybody assumed that the industrial areas of the estuary of the of Thames were uh, you know beyond hope but when you get more informed you realize that due to the major interventions for sewage treatment and so on since the 60s there's been a huge recovery in the fish in the tidal Thames but what had stopped that recovery from getting any further these are some of the fish by the way so some of these are estuarine species that only local anglers might, might catch and eat, like the flounder. But the species on the left, top left here is the sea bass, which I think is a very commonly eaten food in restaurants. And the little babies of this species grow up in estuaries in the margins 
before they migrate out to grow up in the open ocean. So the margins of rivers are super important to the species, as they are to these other species, like this European endangered smelt in the middle bottom. But what do we do to rivers? We create an ecolope that isn't ecologically um, predisposed whatsoever. We seat pile as an expedient to create land. And this is an example of what they call raking in the UK, which is on the right, you can see a seat pile that was the original one, and it's and it's been damaged, and um, uh, the it needs to be replaced. And a new sheet pile is being put in uh, by encroaching further into the tidal zone, so making the river smaller. Um, and these huge wall ties to hold it in place, so huge structural engineering at very significant cost to reclaim a bit more river when the wall fails. Well, the entire wall of the peninsula of Greenwich was like this. And one option was to do exactly this and replace it with another sheet pile to protect the really high value real estate that we're about to create. However, that didn't tie in with the idea of creating an environmental ecolope with a scheme. And thankfully, at the time, the Environment Agency was looking at rivers differently. And in London said, we've got to stop encroaching on our rivers and reducing them to, to conduits. We've got to do the opposite. We've got to roll back time and create space. And at the same time, they started talking about ecosystem services, which everyone talks about now, but they were talking about it back in the mid 90s saying, look, if you have a sheet pile wall, it's monofunctional, it's not multifunctional. We need to start getting more for our money, um, creating space. And they had some wonderful people working in the fisheries there. So look, we need to look after these little guys. Well, how are we going to do that? Well, my practice got involved in writing guidance on this back, uh, you know, 15, 20 years ago. It was called Estuary Edges. And um, Estuary Edges are particularly interesting architecturally because they're huge tidal forces come to play, unlike in ordinary rivers uh, upstream. Um, you get a lot of silt to deal with. You get um, much bigger forces generally. This has now reached a, a revised version, and it's a very good document to look at the river ecolope in cities where you've got tidal rivers. And bear in mind, many, many cities in the world are built on tidal river systems where biodiversity is extremely important. So what we did at Greenwich um, is illustrated quite well by this picture. So in the top, you see a concrete capping stone, and that is the original sheet pile wall cut down to be just a cantilever below water eye level. So basically, it's just standing up on its own in the mud. And then you've got seven meters of terrace coming up at one in seven, and then a simple concrete L-shaped wall, no wall ties, pre-cast concrete to form the inner side of the fence. Um, and you create a ledge you can plant. Now, the interesting thing about this planting you see below is that twice a day, it's covered by, this, by the salty water of the river estuary. So you're creating a dynamic tidal system intentionally. And whilst it looks straightforward in this before and after picture, I can tell you now the engineers were terrified. Bear in mind the real estate with this. And we had blood on the floor in many a meeting as to how this was going to end universe and civilization as we know it. But um, they since have published how wonderful it is. But that's what happens when you don't really know what's going to happen. You can see here the general concept of terracing river edges in urban areas and creating a more benign ecolope, if I quite like this word, as you probably gathered. And here you have a couple images of, which I really like, and many ecologists would hate, you see, because I'm a bit weird. Um, I'm not your normal ecologist. I quite like design. I quite like human beings, actually, which is very rare for ecologists. And the, you see here that planted design from reeds and sea club rush is still there 20 years later. But what has also changed is nature's done its own thing. And here we have this white flower is something called scurvy grass. English scurvy grass, which is wonderful for lots of reasons. A, it came on its own, B, it's colourful, but also it's culturally fascinating because it's what Captain Cook, our famous explorer uh, of the 1800s, uh, 18th century, gave to his sailors to cure scurvy because it's rich in vitamin C. So we've got cultural history coming in on its own. But the important thing about these images is that the fish like it. So our little baby fish come in, and when they're being dragged back by tidal forces, they get into this habitat, they grow, they use less energy, they get bigger, and they use this as their habitat, such that as the tide rises, the water goes milky with the young fish. And it is now the largest artificial sea bass nursery, I believe, in Europe. So there's an ecolo, which is seen as ecosystem restoration through engineering, 
through bioengineering, through creating, if you like, the eco cyborg to misquote Ken Yang. And here is a, a suggestion for how architecture and nature work together in terms of how do you create a very long tidal sequence from beach to red vegetation, to willows and reeds, where you haven't got the space. The answer is you fold the beach. So you can see here the beach is folded like a jackknife. And so you get all these things by, by sloping the beach in two planes and create all those ecotones in a shorter lateral distance. But having done this, you then need to explain a massive part of what we did at Greenwich was public engagement explanation. Did you know that one in two Londoners think there's something wrong with the River Thames because every now and again it goes down? They think someone's pulled the plug out like a bath. Right? They don't know it's tidal. So Basic environmental ignorance in our relationship with nature is beautifully illustrated by that. And that middle image is Andrew Grant's solution to this in signage terms. And that pole is how high the tide would rise above existing ground levels if you didn't have the flood barrier. So all of a sudden you start understanding how ridiculously vulnerable our, our estuarine cities are. And as I say, there are many around the world. And again, this sign here explains the folded coast and the sign on the left is a is redolent of the Greenwich Meridian of the timeline. Because history and knowing where we've come from is fundamental to eco-urbanism. But then we were asked, you know, what sort of landscape do you create inland of all of this? And I said to Michael Davis of Richard Rogers Partnership at the time, a wetland. And he said, you're mad. We've got a whole river out there. We need more dry land. We need a place to kick a ball. I said, this is what it wants to be. And it will have the most impact for the most people. And I was laughed out of court. But what is we've done there is create what I believe is a real success through multifunctional design thinking, which gives far more uh, of this urban village, which is called the Millennium Village, a water frontage. It gives a different water frontage because this is fresh water, not salty water. And it gives a nested Russian doll water frontage whereby people can have access to water and nature can have an inner refuge away from where more people are. This was only a few years after it was done. So this is the outer moat of the Greenwich Peninsula Eco Park. And within a few years, you know, we have one, a very healthy nesting on turn colony and kingfishers and other wildlife coming in and um, a very biophilic setting for these buildings. Like or hate the architecture, I quite like this, but you get phenomenal views, biophilic views from the inside here that are second to none. Um, and it's an important social hub. This is another habitat within there, was created as part of the urban matrix ecolope, if you like, and that is older car, which is a woodland with water running through it. Now, many people have gone to the countryside and seen this sort of habitat. Many haven't. You know, Many kids in London have never been to the countryside especially in Greenwich, quite deprived borough. And one of the most beautiful biophilic feelings you can get is walking over water uh, on a boardwalk through a woodland like this. And you get a, an immersion, as the Japanese would have it with their forest bathing, this immersion in nature, this ability to be in but out, in the dense city, but then get away from it. And when you see the, the 10,000 school kids that go through this every year and the, what they write in the visitor book, they they are in awe and wonder, and they feel that they've gone to another place, and yet this is a bus journey away, not, not an expensive thing for many of these impoverished schools to achieve. And wetlands and water is amazing because nature grows quickly in water. Trees are quicker growing, wetland trees are quicker growing than dryland trees. And so as an urbanist, you get, as the Americans would say, more bang for your buck quicker with wetlands and astonishing wildlife and plants. And in 25 years, less than 25 years, which is a pinprick of time in ecological succession, it's almost at the level of a site of special scientific interest, um, even just for dragonflies and damselflies. This willow emerald has come in from your part of the world. With climate change, these species are transmigrating, and now this is in the south of England. But it's it, there are many, many species that it's now host to. And, uh, and indeed, many rarities, real rarities, rather than just um, urban overspill. This is outside of the wetland. You know, we were working just to create meadows and, you know, on a brownfield site where there was no soil. So the soil was completely made from nothing. It was made by basically starving 
the soil and, and producing a very low nutrient matrix. Um, terrifying, literally terrifying for landscape designers because it doesn't look good for a few years because you're starving the landscape. But if you want diversity, you can't make the landscape fat. You have to starve it of the sort of nutrients that will lead to one or two species dominating. So this is an example, and this site now is one of the best sites in the whole of London, and that's including old sites to see cowslips like this. I put this picture in because, and I'm not gonna mention names, but we didn't have the final say in the design of all the landscapes on the peninsula. This was the main central part you may recall from the earlier slide. It was designed as uh, a setting for the dome, uh, if you like an alley of trees either side with a central green space that led up the dome, very dramatic. I think the entire European population of hornbeams from nurseries was cleared out. Very nice for someone growing hornbeams, I'm sure. Um, there were um, ivy was planted underneath to create a general ground cover, which is very little use to anything living when it's horizontal. And daffodils put in, which are non-native daffodils, to just give a bit of color one time a year. But basically, you create a, a landscape, stylized landscape that may look good on day one or, or achieve the purpose of a vista. But in day-to-day -day life, it's next to useless. And the aim was to reduce this over time, and maybe they are doing that. But this landscape cannot stay this way if it's going to have a high functionality for people and wildlife going forward. The other thing was to Terry Farrell we looked at was the intermediate matrix. And so it may interest urbanists hit on the call that we looked at normally the ecologists would stop at the parks, even if they got involved with that or at the river edge. But we went through every mean street and looked at the hierarchy of routes in a systematic way and said, what would happen if you took nature as a, as a key design informant rather than something you could squeeze in afterwards? So you end up, if you like, with a series of streets doing different things. And of course, occasionally they, they cross. So then you get the interesting conundrum. What do you do when they cross? Do you just give precedent for the route with the cars or do you do what do you do? And the design aim was wherever the crossings happened, there was a strong reference, of, you know, doffing of hats to the ecological element. So you so every single street was considered as part of the important eco to these buildings such that in a residential street where you, you didn't have cars, you, you could really work at maximizing uh, the ecological envelope with green walls, which were not very popular and still aren't in most of the UK, uh, with water, which again, people are terrified of, but is fundamental about the environment and green roofs, and create a place where it's much nicer to be and wildlife will thrive rather than a place as a conduit, just conduit for people movement. And you can see some examples that started to emerge from this uh, on the peninsula. And then, you know, where you have to have cars and parking, then using the vegetation is very much part of this eco cyborg where you can combine the functionality of the vegetation. It might be clipped trees to create a certain shape that is more efficient for, say, trapping particulates in car parking. Um, maybe you even coppice them uh, and turn, use them as fuel, but very much looking at the green infrastructure as part of the functional design of the street in its entirety. And even in the hardest surfaces, I've noticed that in the peninsula, there's still an incredible desire to put in uh, mini installations for biodiversity pollinators, regardless of uh, this area being primarily designed as a piazza for people to walk on. And we also had the opportunity to do historic and, and measured plantings. These are a couple of examples of one of the most important wetland trees or important uh, uh, conservation challenge trees in the UK, the black poplar, which were planted by um, uh, a, a famous celebrity here um, back in the season, Hampshire, the film actress who was the head of the International Tree Foundation at the time. I was there when they planted them. This is maybe 15 years later. So recorded plantings, uh, ecological history creation. And what I call this is fighting locational autism. You're actually saying this place wanted to be or was a, a wet woodland in Roman times. Let's understand where we've come from, come back to some of the majesty of this. At the same time, as doing something for really important UK biodiversity, such as this native black poplar. And then the roofs, and everyone knows about green roofs now, to one extent or another, but this was one of the largest and perhaps the first district-wide green roof master plans in the UK. And we did this back in 1998. So we 
we were looking at the very typologies. We were looking at Europe and how that was so much ahead of everything we were doing in England uh, and UK. And we tried to learn from that. And over the time, you know, this has been slowly built out. Um, I'm not sure how successfully, because I haven't been involved in too many of the roof installations on the peninsula, but we did take the thinking further in Stratford, as I'll explain in a minute. But the, the fundamental function of this is at the scale it's at. And I first really got that when I went to Basel with Professor Stefan van Eysen and saw the scale at which the ecolope of the city on the roofs was writ large over the whole city. And all of a sudden, you, you understand the value. It's not just one or two buildings. It's a system. And it's affecting urban climate. It's affecting um, uh, urban air quality. It's affecting even urban noise. Um, and, of course, affecting biodiversity. So it's a real ecolope, it's a real system when seen at scale in context. So <laughs> later on in 2012, when it came to the athletes village, we were with this background thinking, how can we take all this on further? And the village was built quite quickly for the how's the athletes for Olympic games. It's quite blocky, it was quite functional, it was quite cost effective way of just building a lot of flats quickly. But the aim was always that this would turn into rental housing afterwards. And the landscape was built as legacy landscape from day one. So whereas the buildings had to change function, the landscape was always looking long term. And so with Voc Landscape, we looked at this as an eco that had to be native biodiversity based. They were very strong on that, even though it was in the heart of very, very dense urbanism. That's what's particularly significant about this scheme. It's quite a large area, quite a few hectares, so maybe 12, 13 hectares. And you can see there's quite a lot of green if you look at it holistically in every single street. And as again, it's the same principles Greenwich. Every single street, no matter how urban, uh, was considered in terms of maximizing its potential for both biodiversity and ecosystem service provision. So partly because nothing was overlooked, it, it works as a whole quite well. Although there's still many tricks missed because there's only so far we could go given the practicalities. And one of the things we started with, so just quickly going back to this, was, was, the, um, was the roofs. Now, I haven't shown these roofs here um, as green, but if you look at the original picture I showed, you can see on this image that every single one of these roofs is vegetated. And why was that important? Is because we wanted to do not just design for biodiversity, design for water, water-sensitive design and climate change. So every roof was going to be green. It's the first point rain would fall and intercept. And in doing this, we could have gone to any one of any of the major companies, the Bowders, the Alamas, the people who do these sorts of systems. Um, but we wanted to do more than that. And there was inv enlightened investment in a research project, which took a year, looking at how we could mimic some of the best native habitats on the roofs. Um, we actually ended up going and sampling some of the sites of special scientific interest in the wider area around Stratford, and then working with a soil scientist, Tim O'Hare, mimicking those soils as best we could chemically, whilst also playing tricks on them with such things as clay aggregate granules to reduce loadings. And then we ended up with four typologies of soil, one for neutral grassland, one for calcareous grassland, um, uh, say neutral to acidic grassland, and, and then one for a brownfield rocky grassland. Um, uh, so we had a variety of typologies and you know, installed them on the roofs and have monitored them ever since. Once the water comes down off the roofs, it then enters a landscape at ground level and a series of wetlands. Um, and you can see here the intention to create native habitats in a dense urban setting. And this is highly controversial, you know, whether it's limited space, a high urban density, and there may well be in a few years, this will all be mown grass, who knows, but the, the, the rationale for doing this was very, very strong and articulated about the biophilic benefits of this in terms of its visual, auditory, tactile, or factory benefits would far exceed just having, you know, typical parkland with trees and grass as an eco -load. And, you know, concepts such as bringing in early maturity to the ecosystem by bringing in death, bringing in dead wood, you know, bearing in mind that a lot of ecosystems are based on complex food webs, many dependent on invertebrates, which deprive uh, part of their life cycle live on dead wood. And of course, when you create a new landscape, there's no dead wood. So we put it in at the beginning. 
And then the water heads into a series of ponds where it settles out and ends in something called the water glades, where I learned from examples in Poland and elsewhere in Europe how different wetland habitats have different functions for dealing with water in, in process. And so to mimic that and to use uh, an ecological mimic of that, we did a sort of, again, this eco-technological mix where we took those native habitats like wet woodland I showed you earlier and a marsh, but then took the water through it in a very engineered trombone system, a long journey through that, because that is the science behind retention times and cleaning up water. And you can see we've got check weirs and everything to slow down the water, um, slow down the time clock. And you can see the effect of that runoff going through this water. It gets very cleaned and the trees are very good at taking out one particular nutrient, which is phosphorus. And then marshlands do other things. Again, we planted dead at dead trees to provide the ecosystem uh, stimulus at the beginning for dead saproxylics, deadwood saproxylics. And then marshland at the end is a polishing system, all native plants, um, which did the final treatment before the water ended in a final receiving pond at the end here you can see. And um, there it is, again, with floating rafts and all features which are look natural to some, but are actually highly contrived engineer, bioengineered things, which help to maintain water quality and provide niches in very small spaces, uh, which is often the problem we face in urban areas, for wildlife and minimize uh, eutrophication. Now, closing the loop is that water pumped from here flushes toilets in the school at the top of the build, at the top of the park, and also all the trees are irrigated by this water that's circulated through. And in a drought year, if that system breaks down for whatever reason, they are in trouble there. They need it uh, to maintain these trees as ecosystem service providers in the urban setting. And what have we achieved in terms of biodiversity tooth and claw? Well, in only 10 years in this case, we already have national rarities, true rarities like this wonderful malachite beetle that have turned up in the, the wetland. Um, and various types of longhorn beetles, which are, you know, these are species that are relatively rare in the UK, and other wondrous beasts that excite kids when you show them writ large what as they've got on their doorstep. And these are only going to occur in these sorts of wetlands. This one isn't that rare, but it's a phenomenal uh, looking creature. And we've had open days where, you know, people just love to learn on their doorstep what they have. Um, wonderful book I recommend to you called Urban Place, which talks about locational autism, a lovely phrase invented by the Americans, which means you, you know you're somewhere, but you don't know where that is. And that has an effect on your psyche that's quite harmful. Um, it can even affect academic institutions to the point at which academic output is affected. And simply by the mechanism of understanding your place and having an emotional relationship to it can change productivity. And there was a famous example of this called the Piedmont Project. I recommend you read about in the States where the outcome products of that in the academic institution were extraordinary. Um, so I'm, I'm going past this, but there were a lot of rarities that came out of that many, many rare species only in 10 years. And I'm sure within a 20 years time, it will be up there with the designatable sites. Of course, they've already in just in 10 years, keeping bees and producing honey, um, ecosystem services, uh, the purest ecologists will say this is not a good thing because bees are domestic animals. Uh, honeybees are domestic animals and they compete with native bees. Uh, and it's, the thing is balanced. So if you have too many hives and you don't have enough flowers, your ecolope is unbalanced. And, and that's what happens often. People say, oh, we'll get so excited about bees. We'll have lots of hive. That's a mistake. You've got to have an awful lot of forage. Uh, and then it's fine. And then you can have both. And we did. 10, 15 years ago, we started seeing how these various habitats from the wetlands, the park, living rooms would provide ecosystem services on a very simple scale. And you can see here, just from, in relation to the literature on biophilic benefits and food and everything else, wetland scores super high, a well-designed park really high, and living rooms you know, pretty good. But you start starting to see how these things are serving the people in a very simple matrix. This isn't clever, high fluting. Uh, uh, metricized science, but it's still worth doing. Just to show you a little bit of the research we've been doing, since there may be um, uh, serious academics on the call, um, I this is not serious academic research because in, in in practice it's hard to do. But we've had a, a, a shoestring budget to monitor, 
So we've looked at some of these roofs. Um, as I say, that different roofs across the peninsula had different soil chemistries, uh, created soil chemistries. And you can see some of the habitats being created. Um, and what I want you to just, because I thought this was a marvelous segue to your program, of wonderful program on Ecolopes, which is look at this parapet. So what is a better symbol for an ecolope than a parapet? It's an enclosure, right? It's something that protects. But why would you parapet a roof no one visits? Why would you do that? I, you know, why did this happen in the first place? Interesting, I'm not sure because I wasn't in all the thousands of meetings there were, but what I can tell you is it has a phenomenal effect on the ecolo, on the, on the system. So you can see here quite a healthy looking sward. I mean, some of these azeric plants like to see them, but it's a mixture of more than that. And these are some of the other images with a high parapet, some of the incredibly dense vegetation that you get, including fairly fragile species such as bee orchid. And, you know, there are you know, species doing very well, even if they're xeric tolerant, drought tolerant, they do better and flower better and produce more nectar if they're in a, a roof with a parapet, which is less prone to drying out by the wind. And of course, if you're an invertebrate and using this sort of habitat, you're not blown about as much. So energetically, it seems intuitively better. You can see the difference on a roof without such a parapet, where only really xeric tolerant grasses are surviving here, mainly species of vulpia. And, you know, biennials such as the bugloss growing, this is a tough thing and it isn't very good to see it. And bees were using it, but only the larger bees, you can see it's a very windy site and there's nothing to protect from the wind. Uh, where you have a higher parapet again, lusher vegetation um, and, and, and species like Centauria doing well. Um, but you can see these bees, this is quite a rare bee now in London, one of the carder bees, but, you know, looking, thinking of, uh, Imagining you were a drone this size, and it's always a very useful design tool to be Lilliputian in your design. Turn yourself into a little creature and see how you would change your design for that creature. Because these species are obviously thriving on these habitats, but only as long as they can get there easily and not get blown away halfway across London when they go down and up the building. Um, honeybee again, so honeybees are benefiting from the green roofs at five or six floors up, up um, quite clearly. And over time, I wanted to show you what happens with the plants. I mean, this is a rare plant that's so rare, it's protected by law in the UK under Schedule 8 of the Wildlife and Countryside Act. It's called Jersey Cudweed, and it's self-colonized on these roofs because it's a very xeric tolerant species. But so this bizarre mixture of conditions, and this is one of the more acidic roofs, and you can see this uh, nationally rare plant has colonized, where every single instance of this plant needs to be reported to the Conservancy. You can also see how the ecosystem is developing for the rest of the biota, is, 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 as, as Dr. Professor Weiss was saying, you know, it's not just the big visual stuff, it's the, all the microbiota, and here you can see that. Um, this, actually, I have to say, when you dig into this, it really is like a soil. But you lose a lot of species, but you gain many others that come in from the aerial plankton, and these are two species, for example, the melilot on the left and the hairy tear on the right, which colonize of their own, uh, their, their own volition. And... Um, Again, you can see they're going to have wildlife value, they're native or ne neonative, they're near naturalized, which therefore they still have quite a lot of value to fauna. And these images were designed to particularly uh, e designed equal, they were designed to try and attract uh, burrowing bees and uh, whether they be wood boring or soil boring. But it just illustrates one point looking at these images, which is that there's no free lunch in urbanism. The idea of low maintenance landscapes makes my blood boil. Everybody's looking for low maintenance, easy landscape design because there's no money. Well, frankly, if there's no money, don't build it. You know, you're not going to build a building and then say, well, we can have windows, but if they go, well, never mind, we won't bother replacing it. Or if the roof goes, oh, well, you know, we just get a bit wet. You wouldn't do that with a roof. You shouldn't do that with nature. It should be maintained. It's not rocket science. It's not massively energetic to maintain these, it is a health and safety consideration. If you can get over, as I'm sure in Europe, they could do better than England, um, and this is England rather than the rest of the UK I'm talking about, um, get people up there. The one thing you have in a city is a huge human resource begging to take part in these things for free. And tapping into that has to be the future eco-urbanism. Sorry, Mike, do you, uh, to... do you, do you, uh, do you think that you can wrap up in 10 minutes or? Uh, I think wrap up in five. 
Okay, sorry great. To, 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 to go on. I, I'm sorry if it's uh, lasting a bit long, but I'm very close to the end of this. So the the effect of this is very marked on, you know, rarities turning up on the roof, such as these ferns, wherever there's a little bit more shelter from the protection given from that. And so this is just, you know, measuring the eco, what actually happens. So when you have a lot of species and there's always great ambition that all these things you see will do brilliantly well. And this is what we did. So an average of 36 species went down over decade to maybe 30 species, but they're not the same species. What you actually get is a much stronger decline in the ones you actually sowed uh, down to, you know, nearer um, uh, a third of those. Um, but, uh, you know, down to only about eight of the ones you specified from the 30. Um, but we had 136 species colonizing, um, many of which were annuals or biennials, but there were over half perennials. So, you know, the nature designs itself. So this balance between providing the conditions for the ecolope, designing it from initial thinking and for allowing nature design is a very interesting research dynamic that needs to consideration. But this wind protection is very clear. And what's very interesting is that the more wind protection there was in terms both of the parapet and also the surrounding building context, this, this index takes both those factors into account uh, qualitatively, the more higher plants you had. The trouble is all the roofs were different sizes. So there was another relationship. So the bigger the roof, the more the species. But using statistical techniques, analysis of covariance, you can separate those two effects. And if you take out the effect of the area of the roof, the effect of the shelter is still there. So it's, it reduces the significance, but shelter your roof. If you're going to do the ecolope, you've got to consider the environment and protect it from the wind and the desiccation of the wind. And these are some of the wonderful creatures that rock up and thank you for it. Um, these species tend to occur in uh, rarities of sandy, this windswept areas. That, and these, the interesting, whether or not this is particularly rare, and it's, it's uncommon, not particularly rare, it doesn't occur in the habitat ground level in the village. So the, the aerial ecolope on the roofs is different to the one below, and it has a different function for biodiversity, like this bug, which is, this is an interesting example of the human effect on ecolope, because this particular mm -hmm. animal has spread across Europe through green roof industry uh, in cedar mats, because it lives on cedar. Um, so there's an a, a anthropogenic effect. Um, but then you get another species like this beautiful Adonis ladybird, which again doesn't occur at ground level, only occurs on these particular environments and is thriving on these environments where its rural sites are potentially threatened. So we need to design for it and we need to think about it and we need to manage it. And we're only just beginning to understand how to optimize it. So this is a view through from the village through to um, Canary Wharf and the and, and the uh, the tall towers of central London and the um, the, 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 the uh, canal system uh, in London. And, you know, we, we need to understand that whenever we create anything like this and we research it, we need to start scaling and spreading the message and seeing how we can learn from this by repeating it and better doing it better in many, many more circumstances. Sorry if I've gone on a little long. I think I'll stop there. Thank you. Find out more about our research on www.ecolopes.org and on our social media platforms.